BBC Studio Social has launched a new in-house global digital sales venture, giving advertisers the opportunity to partner directly with over 90 premium BBC Studio social channels. Partners can now align with premium content from Doctor Who to Bluey, BBC Earth to Top Gear and many more. Captivating digital audiences with innovative, safe, award-winning social-first content, BBC Studio Social is now offering advertising, sponsorship and branded content opportunities across all of their social platforms. Create, innovate and amplify with BBC Studio Social. For more information, go to bbcstudiosocial.com. Telecast. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to another Telecast. On this week's show, I'm joined by Tom Price, Content Distribution Director at Roku, as we chat streaming, bass channels, how he's planning to help build the business in the UK, and the latest deals the company has struck. It's coming right up on this week's Telecast. My guest on this week's show is Tom Price, Content Distribution Director at Roku. Welcome to Telecast, Tom. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for having me on the show. Roku is a name on lots of people's lips at the moment for for lots of different reasons. So it'd be really interesting to have a chat about Roku and all the different things that are going on with the business. Before we get on to that, let's talk a little bit about your career so far, because I know you had a pretty lengthy stint at ITV before you joined Roku. As you say, I, I've had a, a long and, and really happy time at ITV. So, I mean, I started out many years ago as a, as a strategy consultant and from there joined Discovery, which was really my first step into TV. And from that point, I joined the strategy team at ITV. Unfortunately, just as the economy and the TV advertising market, you know, all came crumbling down around this. And it was a, you know, it's a pretty hairy time at ITV, which had a lot of debt at the time and kind of wasn't seen to have a, have a plan. So there was a, a lot of work in the strategy team to sort of come up with a, a new plan that, you know, could convince people that we, we knew how to turn things around. A lot of it wasn't rocket science. And what I really worked on in the years following that is a lot of taking the plan and just trying to actually make it happen. And as, as a result of that, I did loads of really interesting things. You know, I spent time helping trying to rebuild relations between the studio and the network, which were, which were in a pretty rocky place back then. I spent time discussing regulations for advertising with Ofcom. I spent time uh, helping build the case to launch the ITVB channel and relaunch ITV2 as a really pure 16 to 34 play with shows like Family Guy and Plebs and, of course, Love Island. But if there's one thread that really runs through my time at ITV, I think it's been that what we would have called back then the internet, that the internet is coming. Uh, we didn't really call it streaming back in the day. So the first project that I got handed when I joined the team at ITV was a, a project called Project Kangaroo, which is a an ill-fated uh, joint venture between ITV, Channel 4 and BBC Worldwide, which would have been a really pioneering internet delivered television service at the time uh, and was unfortunately shut down by the regulator, which I think most people now now view that as a mistake. We had an office and a team building it and it was it was sort of all guns go to get this thing launched and then it came to an abrupt halt. That was really set up to compete with Netflix essentially, wasn't it? I think a lot of people view a lot of the networks in the UK and many others across Europe and around the world has been very slow to react to you know the streaming challenges. But essentially, maybe they weren't that slow in this case. Maybe uh, you were competing you know, at a relatively early stage. When we launched, it was almost more focused on competing with the iTunes download store, which existed then because, you know, Netflix had only just uh, started getting out of DVDs and into to streaming at that point. We obviously had that on our radar as well. And it was as much about AVOD and TVOD as well as SVOD. So it was really a sort of an all encompassing play. And maybe it was it was too all encompassing, which got us into trouble. I think that was probably a misstep and would have been better if it had gone ahead. We didn't give up. I went on from that. I worked on UView, which was a, another joint venture with the BBC and Channel 4 and also BT. I mean, if I take one lesson from UView is don't try and negotiate a seven-way joint venture again, uh, especially not one that's got as varied personalities as the BBC, British Telecom and Richard Desmond involved. As SVOD clearly was the the growing thing that's you know, been the massive trend in the last few years, 
I got very involved with BritBox at ITV. So I did the deal to set up BritBox initially in the US, which has been, you know, a super successful business and it's grown into Canada, Australia, Nordics, other markets as well. Uh, It's been great in terms of building that really clear niche service for British content in those markets. And also in terms of the, the funding it's putting back into making shows in this country. So BritBox is something I'm really proud of internationally. And then I'm also really proud of BritBox in the UK, where I was commercial director We took that from a sort of basically four people and a whiteboard up to the service that had about almost 800,000 subscribers at the point we decided to bring it together with ITVX. And, you know, we really built a service and an app and a team and, you know, made new shows from a real scrappy startup position. Incidentally, uh, doing the distribution deals for BritBox was the first thing that introduced me to the team at Roku. So in a a way, it also found me this job. What... Do you think the main lessons that you learned from setting up BritBox and uh, rolling that out, what are the key lessons that you've learned that you're bringing to your new role at Roku? I think it all starts with the content. That's the, I mean, it's a a bit of a trite statement in television, you know, content is king and all that. But that was what we really had going for us at BritBox was we had, you know, some of those, those amazing libraries of content. And, you know, there are lots of people out there who've got, content which appeals either in a broad sense or maybe there's a niche audience that that content really works for so it's it's got to start from the content the thing that actually you know living and breathing BritBox every day you know subscriber acquisition and churn you know technical issues all of this is that the content on its own isn't enough you have to really create that brand and that service and that user experience that delivers the content in the right way to people. Because the content existed before we set it up, but we were able to create something, you know, more than than just the sum of the parts, I think. And that's what everyone is trying to do in this space. And it's incredibly competitive. There's S4, there's A4, there's, as you say, T4, there's, you know, free content is becoming more and more prevalent you know there's obviously pressures on people's budgets and seeing the explosion of fast at home and also the way that people are accessing content brand is really key and that's something that we spoke to Cedric at Rakuten last week about and it was the importance of brand to them I mean they obviously in Spain they spent a lot of money sponsoring FC Barcelona to bring that Rakuten brand to that audience in Spain that mass market audience Content is one thing, but brand is another, isn't there? With seemingly hundreds of fast channels launching and free content available all over the place, you know, whether it's program brands or channel brands, investment in brand is really, really key in terms of differentiation, isn't it? It's a mix of all these things. You can't do it without the content. You can't do it without the experience and the product. And, you know, a lot of media companies are having to learn from the likes of Netflix about what it takes to deliver a really great experience. And, you know, that's something that Roku is really focused on. And, you know, we have, you know, when I look at the the engineering teams we have working on making the experience better at Roku, it gives me a real appreciation of, of what it takes to do that really well. Brand, in, in my view, is, is the thing that ties together everything you've got and helps tell that story to the user. But you can't do it all with brand. You've got you've to have the fundamentals under it as well. Coming on to Roku then, your role is content distribution director. Tell us about what that entails. So I head up content distribution for the UK, and that means I'm responsible for our relationships with all of the big local players that we have on our platform. So whether that's the BBC or Sky with the Now TV app and Sky News and others, Sky Store, they also have, whether it's ITV or Channel 4 or, you know, Channel 5, and then some of the smaller apps that are that are London-based, some of which actually are, are global apps, but based out of London as well. So but my, my main focus really is to link Roku in the UK into the, the local TV industry and get all of those relationships working as well as they can. Obviously, everyone's aware of Roku, I think, but our listeners are all around the world and they may have a different relationship with Roku than ones in other territories. It's an OS, it's an original channel in some places, and obviously it's a access via uh, different devices. Can you just give us a bit of an overview about what Roku is and, and how you can access it? 
it's a really exciting company and one that I think isn't as well known in the in the UK as it as it is in some other markets. Part of my job actually with partners is really giving them that story. Roku sold its first streaming player to let people watch video streamed from the internet on a television set way back in 2008. So just when, you know, the year after Netflix had added a bit of online video to its DVD by mail business, actually back when I was doing Kangaroo at ITV, that was when Roku had its first product out. What was the the belief of that product is that just because video is delivered over the internet, it doesn't mean that people should have to compromise in terms of picture quality or watching it on the, you know, the best screen in their house, which is normally the, the big main television set. And they shouldn't have to compromise in sound quality and picture quality, any of that. And underlying belief at Roku is that we think in future all television will be streamed and all advertising will be streamed. And Roku is a company that's the heart of driving forward that revolution. So from from what was essentially a startup, Roku has grown into the market leader for streaming on TVs with over 70 million households worldwide using the Roku platform to access content. So we're kind of a giant that, that people in the UK may may not have heard of. The other thing that maybe, as you say, sometimes confuses people a little is, you know, are we a, are we a hardware company? Are we a content company? Um, the background, as I said, is we started out making devices and we still sell millions of streaming six and players. But Roku is really, a, I think, a software company that's created an operating system that's optimized for television. And that runs on the players, but it also increasingly runs on, on TV sets themselves. And we work with dozens of manufacturers worldwide to make TVs that have got Roku built in. And then the other thing that Roku is because of that is it's a platform company that offers users a great range of entertainment. And it offers both the content companies and the advertisers a route to reach those millions of customers. That's really what Roku's DNA is. And on top of that, we then have some content services of our own, particularly in, you know, in our bigger markets, the Roku channel, which is a, a full AVOD service and fast channels and, and more that's included in that. So our biggest market is the United States. And in fact, a, an interesting stat I saw recently, which is the combination of our growth and cord cutting is more homes in the United States have Roku, I think, than all of the cable operators combined now. And if you think how big cable was in the US, that's that's really quite a milestone. So, you know, the US is the core of Roku. What's driving that growth, Tom? I mean, is, it, is that about being built in? Is it the distribution and the, the fact that it's been, you know, essentially... Because uh, I know there's Roku 4K TVs, aren't they, that retail, but also there's the dongles and everything. Else. What's really driving that growth? The, the future growth is really being driven by by TVs and the current growth. So, you know, historically, Roku was about something maybe that you plugged into your TV in order to watch streaming on your TV. But a bit like people don't tend to sort of stick a tom tom on their car to get sat nav anymore. You know, the future is that your TV will, will do it all. And most of our focus for our growth you know players are still a big part of the business but our focus for our growth is really Roku TV both in the US and in the and in the UK and and I should say that you know whilst the US is is the home market Roku is I've got a huge focus on international growth as well we're available in 19 countries whether that's you know Canada Mexico Latin America Germany and of course the UK which which is where my focus is there's some recent deals that you've done, which are all seem to be fairly substantial. Those are content deals. So can you tell us a little bit about the Viaplay deal that you've just announced? Yeah, Viaplay is a is an app from the Scandinavian content group, now called Nent. It used to be called Modern Times. It's slightly different in different markets. So everywhere, one thing it offers is a real sort of uh, Nordic content offer so sort of scandi noir you know crime and 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 much more there's there's so much great television produced out of that that territory and then the second leg it has in some markets is a premium sports element so in scandinavia itself they've got premium sports and then in markets like the baltics in the uk they've bought some sport content as well so we're really pleased to have you know via play launch on roku it's available in multiple territories including the uk including canada and others and it's just an example of how someone who is a, a regional content owner and broadcaster can launch a global service in partnership with platforms like roku Another deal that I saw which really piqued my interest was a deal with Jelly Smack. 
for influencer content, we're obviously seeing huge numbers when it comes to content creators on various different social platforms creating content. But there's a really interesting deal that you've done with Jellysmack to bring that influencer content onto Roku. Tell us about that. That deal, is, it's not my deal, I should be clear. It's from the content team. But what Jellysmack are doing is launching a pair of fast channels on Roku, which are linear streamed ad funded channels with their content, which previously been more more online focused and bringing that to the big screen. And I think what it indicates really is the opportunity that that fast channels give a huge range of content owners and content creators in a, offering them a new way for people to watch their content and for them to to make money out of their content. What I thought was really interesting about that was the fact that, you know, you, there's an assumption that if a content creator is has some content on YouTube, for example, some on Twitch or some on Snapchat, for example, you know, you think that that content obviously builds a long tail, but it's kind of almost forgotten about with, with the speed and of publishing that goes on when, when it comes to uh, a lot of these social channels. But there are different ways to repurpose content that can live a different life on a distribution platform such as Roku. It's just the world that we live in now where there is a vast range of content for people to choose from. And some of this content is, you know, only appealing to a certain group of people, but everyone has got this huge amount of choice. And I think that's what streaming platforms have enabled, you know, whereas previously you might have been dealing with 100 or 200 channels. We have, you know, around 300 channels in the fast service on Roku in the US, but that's in addition to all of the apps and all of the niche content. So if I think about why, why does a customer choose to get Roku? Because obviously there are, there are other uh, systems which allow you to watch watch video on from the internet on your TV. We're not we're not totally unique in that. But the the first and, and biggest reason is because we offer just such a huge range of choice of different entertainment from global services and from local services from big mainstream services like a Netflix or a BBC or a Paramount or an ITV. But also, you know, small niche services. So if you're into anime or, you know, combat sports or opera, you know, there are streaming services on Roku that that would be tailored to your needs. The thing that goes hand in hand with that, though, that I think is quite can be quite tricky is, you know, we find people are often sort of almost overwhelmed by the amount of choice and they struggle to find you know, they, there's a film they want to watch, but they don't know which service it's on. And so the second real thing that Roku has focused on is on developing the user experience to really make it simple for users and, and hopefully delight them with the experience of finding content on Roku. So we have a really slick interface with things like universal search across all of the apps, which on all of our or most of our streaming players, you can activate with your voice. Um, you know, when we get our products reviewed, they always rate really well. And when we survey our users and we do what's called a, a net promoter score, some people will be familiar, but basically it's, you know, would you recommend this to a friend? You know, in the UK, we have really, really high net promoter scores. So although we're not the biggest platform in the UK, the people who've got it uh, really love it. And then the third reason that, that people choose Roku is because we believe that to get that great experience, it doesn't have to come with a high price tag. So value is a really important part of what Roku does. It's been designed from the ground up to run, you know, on really cost-effective hardware. And, you know, with the cost of living crisis, more people are looking to save money. And, you know, TV is a place that, that we're seeing some of them are going. So Roku works with our manufacturing partners to try and bring the latest technology, things like QLED, which is quantum LED, it's basically, you know, better picture quality. You know, things which are normally found in the more expensive TVs will really get under the skin of how we can bring those cost effectively with our partners to the Roku TV set. So by buying Roku, you're getting the best without having to always pay as much. And then the second element of value, of course, is that we give people the freedom to choose which services they want to subscribe to. You don't have to subscribe to anything on Roku. Some people have got a similar service to us. You might be tied into a long contract or something like that. Whereas Roku, you know, you can pick and choose. You could take Netflix, you could take Amazon, you could take Now and Sky, uh, you could take ITV Premium, you could take Paramount, or you could take none of them. You know, for some people, the best possible price is free. And 
you know, in the US, we've led the way with our own free service. In the UK, there is a huge wealth of great free content that's available already from the from the big local public service broadcasters. And we, we make all of that available. Talking specifically about the UK, now we've seen that the success and what's driven in the US, but your role is obviously going to be involved with the team in terms of building the profile and building the business of Roku in the UK. What is going to drive that? What's your main focus in terms of bringing Roku to more consumers in the UK? Well, we're really committed to the UK. uh, And the way Roku thinks about it, you know, we have certain markets we've prioritised for growth, and the UK is one of those. We actually have kind of deeper UK roots than a lot of people realise. Our founder and CEO, Anthony Wood, was actually born here and moved to the US as a child. And we've got really big, we've got a big engineering base in Cambridge, focused on TVs, another one in Cardiff around ad tech. And we're building another engineering base in Manchester, as well as the, the London office I work in, which has got as well as content distribution, things like ad sales. So, you know, we've got quite a big footprint here already. We've got a number of partners now selling TVs and, and more on the way. And we're really just in a phase of, of increasing the, the number of Roku options we've got, especially in Roku TV, in terms of brands and retailers and different screen sizes and features and functionality, because, you know, people choose different TVs for different reasons, so that we can build a really, uh, you know, significant share in this market. I've spent a lot of time at ITV. I've spent a lot of time around the public service broadcasters. I kind of appreciate the specialness of the British television industry and you know, I, I go to some conferences and people are sort of worried about the future and what is, is streaming going to destroy it. And I think we're really here to to work in partnership with the local services, the PSBs and, and the, the non-PSB services here, the commercial sector, and find a way to help them reach a, a streaming audience that they may be a bit worried is, you know, is disengaging with linear TV. I think in the last 18 months, we've really seen, you know, the BBC, ITV with ITVX, Channel 4, who are renaming all four, you know, I think they've announced. We've seen these moves, which I take as a really positive commitment to streaming by the incumbent players who can see that they've got to meet the customer where where the customer is. We want to help them do that and help them do it even better. How about originals? Now, this is something a lot of our listeners, obviously, we have a lot of indies and a lot of people from right across the content industry ecosystem. But a lot of people are obviously aware of Roku originals and the deal that was done to buy a lot of the Quibi content feels like a very long time ago that. What's Roku's original content strategy going from here? You know, are are you still commissioning content out of the US? If so, what sort of content is the Roku channel looking to commission? We actually are still commissioning content out of out of that team in the US. In terms of what we're looking for, I should really refer people to David Eilenberg, who heads that Roku Originals team. Uh, I'm probably not the best person to articulate exactly the next thing we're looking for. But, you know, what I'd say about that team is that they're, they're quite opportunistic. The next big thing or interesting thing they do won't necessarily look like the, the last big thing and that they're open to new ideas. So... You know, to pick two things that we've got at the moment, we've got our film TV movie that we made for the Roku channel, uh, Weird, starring Daniel Radcliffe, for which he's been nominated for a BAFTA, playing the sort of legendary US parody music artist, uh, Weird Al Yankovic. And uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the, you know, the slew of sort of music biopics, you know, Rocket Man and Bohemian Rhapsody and uh, that are going around at the moment. And I'd say that, that Weird very much leans into that genre, but in a Weird Al Yankovic parody style. So as, as it goes on, it, it gets gets just sort of more and more bizarre but it's actually hilarious i really really enjoyed it it's a great thing i wouldn't you know i wouldn't represent that roku is about to you know start getting out a huge checkbook and making feature films left right and center but it was a great opportunity from some great contacts the team had and they made it another show i'd I'd highlight is uh the great american baking show which is you know the u.s version of the bake-off from love And that is now a Roku original going out on the Roku channel in America with Paul Hollywood and, you know, many of the team that that people will be familiar with from back here. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, we'll we'll keep our eyes peeled on uh, all these new, as you say, maybe opportunistic deals that have been done out of the US. 
Coming back to the UK, do you currently find Roku branded TVs at, at retail? What's the biggest distribution channel for Roku in the UK? Sort of at all good retailers is is probably what I'd say. So, you know, we're we're stocked in, you know, you can buy them on well-known online services. You can buy them in high street electronics retailers, you know, the likes of Curry's and people like that. We work with a number of brands. So uh, the most uh, visible ones at the moment in the UK are TCL, uh, RCA and Metz, which is a new German brand who uh, we work with in Germany, who are also launched in, into the UK market. So, and there's there's a number of other OEMs we are we're talking to as well. But I, you know, I would expect to see you know more brands and and more units in retail in the in the future. That's Roku branded TVs, but also other brand TVs that have Roku OS baked into it. They're Roku co-branded TVs, so they're with the, the manufacturer and Roku. Something you might have seen in the in the US is we've launched purely Roku branded TVs. I think you can think of those almost like the flagship Chromebooks or Android devices that, that Google makes to show what's what's possible with the platform. But we remain super committed to our main model in TV, which is the co-branded partnership with our key OEM partners. And, and that's, the, that's our focus in the UK market. And now it's time for Story of the Week, where Tom gets to pick the TV industry news story that's caught his eye in the past seven days. Tom, what's your Story of the Week? So a, a pair of stories about Netflix that caught my eye, actually. The first is that Netflix are now have made the announcement that they are shuttering their DVD by mail business, a business I think most people thought they probably shuttered years ago, and it's been sort of carrying on in the quiet background. Time has finally been called on popping a DVD in the post. And obviously Netflix didn't do that in the UK, but I had love film here back in the day. And I That's right. Yeah, me too. I don't know if I remember it fondly, but I, I remember doing it. I always remember losing the uh, losing the DVDs and getting fined an awful amount all the time. I was uh, I was probably a pretty bad customer. But yeah, and then look, obviously Amazon bought Love Film, didn't they, eventually? They did, so that became part of Prime. And then the uh, the other Netflix story, in, in contrast, is that they announced a clothing partnership with the fashion brand Lacoste, so, you know, with the little crocodile, and a range of leisure wear being released based around key Netflix brands and shows. And I thought just taking these two together told us something about where Netflix are on the journey from a sort of internet service company uh, you know, mailing things in the post to something that that's starting to look a bit more like a Disney or an HBO, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, they're making moves into being more of a lifestyle brand, aren't they? Yeah, just uh, well, just a, an owner of IP, an owner of content and, and something that I think feels a little familiar to those of us who've been in the TV business a while. Now it's time for Hero of the Week. Tom, who's your Hero of the Week? So my hero of the week is Barry Humphreys, better known as Dame Edna, who, who sadly passed away. I've put him in this slot because he's the person who made me laugh loudest this week. There's an amazing clip doing the rounds on, on social media of him on This Morning, which on the day he was on wasn't with Phil and Holly. It was with Dermot O'Leary and Alison Hammond. But he chose to uh, congratulate Dermot on his uh, brave decision to come out nonetheless and as it emerges that he's sort of got the wrong guy, he just plays it completely deadpan whilst Alison Hammond is corpsing in the background. And uh, I don't know, it was just sort of one of those live TV moments that I, I think we have to celebrate where you, you go, you, you sort of wouldn't get this from a you know, carefully planned, uh, scripted original, but it's a moment of genius nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. There's also the clip that's circulating as from I think it was a Royal Variety performance when Dame Medna actually comes into the Royal Box and sits down, which is amazing. Obviously, the first time that's ever happened. I think part of that is uh, down to the uh, the future king being a big fan. Dame Medna, Everidge, very sadly missed, and all the other characters uh, that Barry Humphreys had there. And how about what you're putting in the bin this week, Tom? Well, I'm worried this might be a bit controversial because. Uh, I think others might have chosen them for heroes of the week. I'm going to propose that Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney should be going in the bin. Now, they may be other people's heroes for bringing Hollywood glamour to non-league football in Wrexham. But as I come from Chester and grew up there, who are their you know, traditional rivals, it's hard not to look on with a 
with a bit of sort of green eyed envy. So I would say if they have any Hollywood mates who fancy propelling Chester out of National League North and back to their rightful place in the Football League, I will happily take them back out of the bin. But but for now, I'm uh, I'm consigning them to it. Well, I keep seeing Will Ferrell popping up at various football matches. He, he's uh, maybe shopping for a team. He'll have to uh, yeah, get Chester himself. Chester FC, I'm sure, are available. I can't speak for the Supporters Trust, but you know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> what's Chester's ground, Tom? What's the, what's, the, what's the ground called? The Diva Stadium now. I mean, it used to be Sealand Road when I was little, but Chester's ground is kind of quite famous as, as you know, the, the cross-border rivalry with Wrexham. The ground itself, the pitch is actually in Wales, but the car park is in England. When COVID was in full swing, led to some very weird uh, issues about whether they could host football matches there with one part of the stadium in one country and another part in the other. They were trying to do something in the car park, I think, but they couldn't let people use the toilets, which were in Wales. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, Tom, thanks so much for coming on Telecast. It's been really interesting to hear about Roku and, and your plans in the UK. We'll no doubt keep our eyes peeled and see what developments are happening with the business going forward. So uh, best of luck in, uh, in your not so new role, but uh, in your role going forward. Brilliant. Lovely to speak to you, Justin. Well, that's about it for this week's show. As always, thanks a lot for listening. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in Leeds. We'll see you next week. Until then, stay safe.